Hi and welcome to show 10 of the Ultimate Movies broadcast. Thank you for joining me and my co-host from Sweden, Matt Svinborn. A film fan who really gets into those fab B-horror films, he'll have a review of a fave one later on in the show. How are you today, Matt? Just fine, Lorraine. Like Canada, we've been having a cooler than usual summer in 2017. Still nice weather for a jazz fan, and I've been spinning a lot of vinyl. As some of you may know, I've rediscovered the accordion, and I try to practice daily. My cats actually like it. I've also discovered that any song in my accordion books can be played on the violin. So after 20 years or so, I've pulled out my violin. Still in great shape, and I was able to tune it perfectly. My cats don't agree with my violin playing, though, and they go tearing from the room as soon as I start screeching on the strings. I heard you recently played some Elvis on your guitar for a gig, Mats. How'd it go? What songs did you choose? Well, unfortunately, I didn't get to choose the songs, so I had to practice instead. But uh, it will be some of Elvis's 1970s songs, like Moody Blue, and we're also going to do some of his 1950s songs, but in the 1970s version, so wow. it's a little bit different way of playing. So, so this gig is still coming up, is it? It is actually uh, this Saturday. Mm -hmm. Well, hope you have a great gig going there. Thank you, Lorraine. Okay. I hope I can uh, fake it as usual. Is Elvis one of your faves? Well, I like Elvis. He was uh, a great talent. Mm -hmm. I normally listen to jazz, so I don't listen that much to Elvis, but uh, I can't deny that he was a great talent. Really. So, and a great performer, too. He could really grab Absolutely. an audience. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. And now, uh, a moment for our traditional handshake across the Atlantic to start the show. Here we go. Take it away, Mats. Thanks for tuning in from wherever you are in the world. On with the show. Lorraine and I hope you enjoy listening to Larry Castlewell reciting his poetry, John Trepper and Shane Joseph reading excerpts from their recently published books, and... Matt's reviewing his latest B film. All I can say is, as Matt's would say, later Gator. John Treppa has worked in the field of wrongful convictions for many years and is well known for her dedication in the search for justice and her involvement with the Voice of Innocence groups. She has taken up the cause of six men wrongfully convicted in 1992 and then imprisoned in 1995 for the murder of fellow Wisconsin paper mill worker Tom Monfields in her new book, Reclaiming Lives, Pursuing Justice for Six Innocent Men. Only one man has since been paroled and exonerated. Joan shares how she came to write the book and will also read an excerpt from it. I felt it was very necessary to write this book to reveal the many supporting factors that contribute to a much more plausible idea of what may have happened the morning Tom Monfiles disappeared inside that Green Bay paper mill. Those who followed the news reports back then were led to believe this death was forged by union thugs and murderers. Well, I never believed it was a murder to begin with. I've always felt Tom Monfiles had taken his own life. By taking the time to learn about this case, there were so many details never disclosed during the trial or by the media that certainly would have provoked a different outcome. There was urgency to share the tragic aftermath experienced by the six convicted men I believe are innocent and their families who basically were cast aside and largely ignored as irrelevant. Their heartbreaking story was what needed to finally be told and to be heard in the way I presented it. From my perspective as an outsider, a social justice advocate who became the voice they lost years ago, and a legitimate and impartial voice that will not be silenced. I humanize these victims and recount the difficulties they faced then and continue to face today while five of the men remain in prison. One of them was exonerated in 2001, which begs the question of why the others were not also released. If the courts can lump them all together in a joint trial, why is it out of the question to then release them in this manner? After all, there was no credible, credible evidence against any of them, period. 
This book navigates the lengthy journey to find legal assistance for the others so people can see for themselves what a ridiculously laborious and convoluted process this becomes. The book also describes my emotional ties to these victims and lends insight into the new evidence that has since come to light that overwhelmingly supports the innocence of all six men. I share tragic stories of other innocent victims also caught up in what I describe as a flawed judicial system here in the U.S. that makes it really easy to get convicted for a crime you didn't commit. Fact-driven and fact-checked, my intent through the telling of this one specific circumstance is to shed light on the egregiousness of wrongful convictions in our society and to create a massive awareness about this specific Wisconsin case. We cannot and must not let the courts gamble with innocent lives and get away with it. Reclaiming Lives, Pursuing Justice for Six Innocent Men by Joan Trepa. Chapter One, Homegrown Secrets. What do you mean there are innocent people in prison, I asked. How is that possible? John replied, let me explain. In a phone conversation with my sister Claire during the summer of 2009, she described someone she'd met recently. He's an author and researcher named John Gay, she said. We met at a place called the Lorelei, and get this, he told me I look like his mother. We laughed. Claire and John are longtime residents of Green Bay. They'd been dating for a few weeks before Claire asked about bringing John to Minnesota to meet my husband Mike and me. She was anxious for us to hear about a project he was working on. John is researching a true crime story I am familiar with, she said. He's working with two other people on a book about six men who were convicted of murder in 1995, right here in Green Bay. John says it will be published soon. No kidding, I said. That's exciting. I've always been interested in true crime stories. I'd love to hear more about this one. Concern in Claire's voice indicated her deep distress over the circumstances and the outcome. It wasn't until I heard her next statements that I became aware of the degree to which this case affected both of them. I'll let John speak for himself about his connection, but I will say this for now. Both of us have direct ties to this case. John's connection compelled him to take on this book project and do most of the research. In the process, he found many flaws with the entire case that I didn't know about. I always felt there was something terribly wrong with how it turned out, and I'm even more convinced of that now. Plus, I know one of the convicted men. Ray Moore is a good friend of mine, she said. She touched on bits and pieces of how she'd gotten to know Ray. I worked with Ray's wife for many years at the county, she said. When she introduced me to Ray, the three of us ended up hanging out together on many occasions. I wanted to hear so much more, but we decided to wait until they came to our house to visit. When can you and John drive over, I asked. We'll come the weekend after next. It'll be fun, she said. I wrote Crossing Limbo over a period of 10 years. There are 13 stories in this collection. These are stories about people who have hit barren patches in their lives, their limbo, and who are trying to get back on track. Some do, and some don't quite make it. The terrain is vast, the characters diverse. There are failing writers, 
despotic dictators, internet daters and trollers, tantric sex instructors, swingers, immigrants, Holocaust survivors, unemployed executives, and even a dog narrator. I hope you find enlightenment in this collection that I preface with a quote from Dante's Purgatorio, which reads, We made our way across the lonely plain, like one returning to a lost pathway, who, till he finds it, seems to move in vain. This is my third collection of short stories and my seventh work of long fiction. The collection was published by Morning Rain Publishing in Canada and is available everywhere where books are sold. I will read from the first story, Waiting for the Train. In fact, the cover of the book is a scene from that story. It's about two individuals, an old man and a young woman who are contemplating suicide. And they are sitting at two ends of the railway track. So this is the opening of Waiting for the Train. He limped down the pathway between the rows of houses approaching the water. This new estate had taken over his small community, distorting home prices, bringing newcomers and appending the town as another suburb of the passing city that lay hidden behind the curve of the lake. The cancer in his leg had leached into the bone, a slow but relentless crawl, like the urbanization he had once tried to escape when he had fled the city. There is no escape. Then he heard the train whistle, a luring siren. There is... He paused for breath. His heart was not so good anymore, and he had forgotten to take his pills. But it didn't matter now. None of those multicolored, multi-sized portions he took for a variety of ailments mattered anymore. One for high blood pressure, one for cholesterol, one to thin his blood, one for pain, one for his ulcer, the other for his prostate, ointments for his hemorrhoids, and sprays for his lungs and nasal passages weakened by years of inhaling polluted city air, carpet dust, and pollens. The train howled as it rode past, like a dragon from one of his books, eliminating anything in its path, hauling the nation's goods from east to west and back. And obvious to the pollution it brought to the tiny towns it cut through on its relentless mission. Recently, an entire community had been wiped out in Lac Megantic, Quebec, when a park train had woken up and decided to roll back into the little town unleashing its toxic cargo among sleeping inhabitants. Tonight, the train would be his savior. When he came to the embankment, the last of the carriages were moving away, heading west. The whistle was blowing faintly ahead of the string of black cylindrical rail cars. He would take the next one, and there were plenty to choose from, because both national rail lines ran parallel to each other a few yards apart on this stretch of their trans-Canadian journey. In the dark, beyond the lines, the waves of Lake Ontario lapped the shore. The wind was up tonight, and so was the moon, casting an eerie glow on the lush foliage that had yet to wilt in the summer heat. He used a flashlight to find his footing an inch down the embankment. Midway, his weak foot slipped, and he slid, landing on his back at the stony bottom. Pain shot up him, starting from the cancerous knee, traveling through his body, and exited in a muffled scream through barred lips. He crawled over the last stretch to within a couple of feet of the CN track and rolled over on his back to catch his breath. The moon looked benignly upon him, summoning him. In the last year, this glowing orb 
whenever it chose to show itself, had been his only companion, an entity he could talk to, particularly on nights when the insomnia had him in an unrelenting vice. Damn, I used to run up these hills for hours just for exercise, only a few years ago. How quickly we decay when purpose is lost. He turned on his side. Something moved between the CP track and the lake shore. He shone his torch and caught what looked like a bundle of clothes. He laughed hoarsely. <laughs> a scarecrow from the fields transplanted to the tracks, perhaps to scare away the trains. Then the bundle moved and he saw the girl. Larry Kosowan, a friend from Lorraine's high school days, who was heard in shows 8 and 9, returns for show 10 to share four very special pieces. Two rhyming poems, Night in Jail and In My Prison Cell, were originally written while he worked as a correctional officer in Toronto, Ontario. They were published in 2003 in the Scarborough Writers Association anthology, Scarborough Writes 3. Larry recently revised the versions you'll hear today. The two other pieces are prose poems written about the Scarborough Bluffs, a famous landmark east of Toronto that lines part of the northern shore of Lake Ontario. The first is called By the Great Lake. It was written in the 1990s and has also recently been revised. The second is called Land of the Harrison. Larry recited it in April 2017 to local hikers on a James Walk at a park on top of the bluffs known as the Harrison Properties. We'll now listen in as Larry reads his four Inspired by Life works. In My Prison Cell by Larry Coswan. I'm playing cards in a prison cell while the mothers mourn and the victims scream. I'm standing here by the window pane, and I wish it all would just go away. I'm gonna stand by my window pane till you've gone away, so I feel no pain. I'm telling jokes in my prison cell while the victims cry and the neighbors yell. Standing here by my window pane, I can smell the sink, I can hear the rain. It's coming down on my window pane, I can feel the cold. Winter's near again. I'm playing cards in my prison cell. Hear my victims cry and their mothers yell. I want to look from my window pane. All I see is rain. I feel insane. I'm going to stand by my prison cell. Am I going to die? Am I going to cry? Am I going to hell? I don't feel so well. Night in Jail by Larry Cosowan An envelope slipped by an old school friend under the door. My hair stood on end. I was the guard and he the thief. The paper was white beyond belief. He searched my face for my surprise. To look him squarely in the eyes without the others catching on, I took a glimpse and moved along. Our past years passed before my eyes. What had become of our two lives? We had both then worked through the night, writing until the morrow's light. It tore my heart to see and think of him once close, now near the brink. I tucked my chin into my chest and slipped the paper from its sheath to read the words he'd written there. O oh, wretched night, the sounds of jail come jangling through my cell, and I, the prisoner lying here, fly scattered into hell. I spiral through my darkened dreams, the nightmares touch my face. My heart knocks at my panting chest and cries to leave this place. By the Great Lake by Larry Cosowan in the early sunlit morning, 
by the waters of the lake. When you walk along the shoreline, on the path above the bluffs, in the misty distant meadow, I can see you stepping slowly as you cross the path of snails in the wind-strewn, dew-soaked grass. Now as I venture closer, you do not hear my footsteps. You're listening to waves below, to birds in cliffside nests. You see a splashing otter in the pool beneath the cliff, but you do not see me coming, so I stop to watch you, smiling. Your eyes are sparkling brightly, and they're shining deep within. Your smile is sweet and peaceful, and the wind has brushed your face, so your long dark hair has curled into the corners of your mouth. While you watch the seagulls float above the sudden drop ahead. Land of the Harrisons by Larry Kosowan Stop! I smell smoke. I hear a campfire crackling. I've walked this trail in my moccasins when the forest grew high overhead and the trees filled the sky with their leaves. The broad trunks covered in thick ancient bark rose silent and cool in the deep shade. Bushes and vines, dead logs and fallen limbs cluttered these narrow pathways. I've rested on this bluff watched the lake push pebbles onto the shore, heard them wash up and slide back down. I've breathed smoke from a smoldering birch fire after a long, steep hike through the ravine with some speared fish for the cooking pot. I felt the steam swirl, waiting for the stew to boil. I kept all my arrows, a buck, stood motionless between the trees before he slipped away. Inside this strange, forbidding plantation, on the edge of the death-laden bios, there is a horror beyond belief. A scientist turns his cobalt rays on the revolting scaly monarchs of the swamps to transform men into hideous living gargoyles whose faces must be forever hidden from human sight. He didn't have to hit him. Quick and simplest way, Doctor. But these are people. You don't handle them like animals. Beverly Garland as the unwelcome visitor, haunted by the fear that the man she loves has become one of them. What are you doing? I'm not leaving here, Mrs. Hawthorne, until I get the answers to the questions that brought me here. What have you done with my husband? Lon Chaney as the hook-armed, hate-maddened Cajun. I'll kill you, alligator man! Just like I'd kill any four-legged gator! Suspense that will clutch you like quicksand. <laughs> pulling you down into bottomless depths of suffocating horror. Mats is back for show 10 with a review of another of those marvelous B-horror films, The Alligator People. Admit it, you've seen this movie on late night TV, or have picked it up in the $5 bin in some department store. You've never really seen an alligator until you've seen one wearing, yes, belted casual pants. The film likely won't scare the pants off you, but it's cheap thrills at their best, and perfect to watch while munching home popped popcorn. Mats now takes you farther down the road where imagination meets swampland and alligators cause people a whole lot of trouble. The film starts with the camera sweeping through the deep Louisiana bayou. And we know we're in for a treat because every Bihar movie that starts in the swampland is bound to be something, something. In the next scene, though, we're at the Webley Sanatorium where Dr. Wayne McGregor is having serious problems with a young girl and has called his friend Eric, played by Bruce Bennett, for help. This young girl, Jane is the name she's using, she's pretty. She helps Dr. McGregor with research in hypnosis techniques. She almost appears perfectly normal, 
hypnosis longer. But why is she switched to a lie detector, Eric asks. Well, you'll see later. She now says her name is Joyce Webster. She was Mrs. Paul Webster. She's not sure whether she is married. She's just not sure. She's going to tell everything from the beginning. She met Paul Webster overseas while she was nursing at a hospital, and they soon planned to marry. The doctor at the hospital had told her that Paul had been more dead than alive with almost every bone broken, torn, mangled, smashed. But look at him now. Not a mark, not a scar. Nobody believes he was even in a plane crash. But he says it was true. When on a train just after they had married, the conductor brings them the telegram wishes. But one of the telegrams make Paul look worried. He even rushes out of the train as soon as it stops at a post depot. Yes, he sets off, leaving her on the train. Poor Joyce was frantic. She gets off at the next stop and returns to the platform, but that's not a sign of Paul. He has vanished. A man you thought you knew had married even could just disappear completely. Joyce hired detectives, checked with the army. The only address linked to Paul that she could find was an apartment hotel. But she did find something months later going through his things, his fraternity pin. The only address he had given when he enrolled his college was in Bayou Landing, a whistle stop in the Louisiana swamp country, and a place called the Cypresses. Naturally, Joyce decides to go there, and when getting off at the train station, a man in a pickup truck picks her up and says he can take her to the Cypresses plantation. She's in the bayou country now. It's so wild, so primitive, and deadly. If the quicksand won't get you, the moccasins will. Then there's always the gators. Dirty, nasty, slimy things. Joyce arrives at the Cypress's plantation and tells the woman who lives there, Mrs. Hawthorne, her story. But Mrs. Hawthorne gets very upset. What is Joyce's game making up fantasy stories like that? Mrs. Hawthorne asks her to leave at once, but there's no trains until tomorrow, so she has to use the hospitality of the Cypress's and stay overnight. But she must under no circumstances leave her room. There's something sinister about the Cypress's. What secret is Mrs. Hawthorne hiding in this strange, unfriendly house? It's a troubled house. Real deep, big trouble. She's here. Paul's wife. Mrs. Hawthorne calls the swamp doctor and Dr. Mark Sinclair. They must decide what they're going to do about her. Mrs. Hawthorne better get over to the swamp doctor at his hospital right away. There, they were just having a little emergency with number six, a covered man. But the attendants didn't have to hit him. Those are people, don't treat them like animals. But what are they gonna do about Joyce? They need time. If Joyce will call the police, it will spoil their last chance. Yes, they need time. The reaction to the x-ray treatment was encouraging, and now they must do a new test. But before experimenting on a human, there must be months of animal experiments. Yes, they took a chance once before with a tragic result. They must make absolutely sure that Joyce doesn't know anything. It's night at the Cypress's plantation. Joyce hears piano music. She feels drawn to the music, a theme she's heard before somewhere. Who could be playing in the dead of night? As Joyce walks towards the music, each step takes her closer to the secret contained in that shadowy house. It was a man. Who was he? And why did he run out into the swamp when he saw her? Well, Joyce may not be sure, but we could see that the man was Paul and he had reptile skin on his face. Joyce will not leave the plantation, not until she gets the answer to the question that brought her there and she's telling that to Mrs. Hawthorne. Mrs. Hawthorne says she's mistaken, but Joyce thinks she's lying. Mrs. Hawthorne has something to hide. What has she done with Joyce's husband? Whatever terrible thing has she done with Paul? But Mrs. Hawthorne would be the last one to ever hurt Paul. She breaks down, crying. She is his mother. Mrs. Hawthorne doesn't think they can keep Joyce in the dark any longer. Paul loves her, and that is why she has to know. But Paul can't tell her. Oh, why didn't Dr. Sinclair just let him die? Paul walks to the doctor in his laboratory because Paul 
has heard it has arrived, the Cobalt 60. It arrived yesterday and Paul wants to try it now, but Dr. Sinclair explains that the radioactive elements can be tried for months and not without extensive experimentation. But there's no time for that. Paul wants it now. But the doctor can't take that risk after the tragedy he has caused already, turning Paul into an alligator man. The Cobalt 60 could help Paul, but it could also kill him. Sinclair needs at least two days to try it on the alligators. He hasn't the slightest idea of what will happen. Paul gives him until tomorrow night. Dr. Sinclair explains the situation to Joyce, how his treatment with alligator extracts once helped Paul, how Paul's mangled limbs became as good as new, just like some lizards can grow a new tail, how Paul's face had been completely gone, but the doctor put it back for a while. But now, reptiles, they are, aren't they? Your patients are turning into alligators. So, how's it gonna turn out? I'm not gonna spoil the ending for you because questions are many. Will Paul survive the treatment or will he die? Will he be Paul the human again or will he turn completely into an alligator? Or did the butler do it? No, wait, that was another film. The Alligator People from 1959, by the way, is directed by Roy LaRue who has also directed films like the first version of The Maltese Falcon and the 1941 comedy Topper Returns, to name just a couple. Starring in the film are, as the main character, Joyce Webster, the lovely Beverly Garland, who some may remember from the 1960s sitcom My Three Sons, and Richard Crane as Paul the Alligator Man. In other roles, we can see Lon Chaney Jr., George McReady, and, as I mentioned earlier, Bruce Bennett. Well, that's all, folks. Back to Lorraine in Canada. Lorraine and I are glad that you joined us wherever you were listening from in the world. And we hope you enjoyed our show. The Ultimate Movies Broadcast Show will be back with more to discover about the marvelous world of film. Goodbye for now. See you then.